today. I just want to say I'm, uh, I'm, I love our church. I love the church so much. It's been a phenomenal opportunity um, to be part of a church. Uh, this past week, our house went, started going through a transition again, and uh, one by one, each adult child left the house. And then Sunday, yesterday, we went to LAX and took Sarah and She's somewhere in St. Louis today in the cold, and then this morning we took Isaiah, or we, or we said goodbye to Isaiah, uh, and I come to church, and there's a couple little kids here who came and hugged me up, said, yes. Someone said, can you hold my child? Yes. Um, I'm grateful for the kids, and I'm very thankful for them. Um, as you stand, we're going to turn to John chapter 17. chapter 17, and we're going to conclude our series from the Gospel of John today. And I'd like to draw your attention to uh, verse 24. John chapter 17, verse 24. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. Uh, I put in your bulletin uh, some notes if that helps you follow along. So it'll have the scripture passages uh, here, the context, and on the back couple um, highlights, hopefully highlights anyways, and help us to remember um, the word of the Lord today. So I ask you to join with me. Chapter 17, verse 24 reads, Father, I desire that they also, whom, I'm sorry, I, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. The living are Christ's eternity. Let's pray. Gracious God, we are grateful today for the opportunity we have to be a church, the opportunity we have to welcome people to the church, to the kingdom of God, to the family of God. Lord, I'm mindful that in today's world, in today's society, Lord, challenges and, and turmoil and anxiousness, um, and yet, God, we, we arrive here to worship the steadfast love, the steadfast faithfulness, the faithfulness of a God who endures from generation to generation, who leads us and guides us through life. Lord, today, as we come to your word, we pray the prophetic word would speak to someone's heart today. We pray, Father, that someone's heart would be opened up, Lord, and through this miraculous form of, of, of art of preaching, Lord, your word, your love would touch and connect all of us today. We're thankful, Lord, for this privilege you've given us on the new year, the start of a new week, Lord, to uh, worship you. Speak to our hearts today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Last Sunday, uh, we discussed having a 2020 vision for our life. If you remember from John chapter 14, we were reminded that the disciples were kind of in a transition. It was a new season. It was going to be a new year. Jesus said, announced that he was leaving, but that he was also was coming back at the same time. He does the truth. How does the truth of the second coming impact the way we live life in the present? Kind of with the approaching of a new season, the dawning of a new year, there was a troubled heart. And some of us may have a troubled heart. And, and we took it to chapter 14, verse 1, when Jesus said, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. There seems to be a lot of great things happening in life, but then there's tragedies all around us. There's curiosities taking place. In the midst of things that should be uh, amazing events, there's, there's murders, there's killings, there's loss of life. Jesus said in chapter 14, verse 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let them be afraid. How many of you have experienced the peace of God? How many of you have experienced the peace of God? That's something we desire and we strive for, that in the midst of changes and challenges, there is the peace of God. 
So we transition today to chapter 17, um, often described and entitled the high priestly prayer of Jesus. Or some may say it's the real Lord's prayer. It's the final prayer of Jesus for his disciples. Or we can say for, the, for us, it displays the deep desire of Jesus has for his followers then. And we can see the desire Jesus has for us, his followers, now. We transition as to chapter 17, but we're reminded that the Lord's Prayer, or what we often refer to as the Lord's Prayer, shows up in Luke chapter 11, uh, 2 through 4, right? Luke chapter 11, verse 1 says, Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come your will be done. Matthew chapter 6, uh, verse 9, records an expansion of that when he says, pray like this, our Father in heaven, holy is your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts or our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Some versions stop right there, right? The, the, the older version, the old school version says, For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you read the King James Version or the New King James Version, it still has that. The majority of the older text has that passage. But somehow when I was reading this this past week, it wasn't in my Bible. I was reading the English Standard Version. I said, wait a minute. So I moved over to Matthew. It wasn't there either. I moved back to Luke. It wasn't there. So I do what most of us do for research. I Googled it. Where is this phrase at? And then I was reminded, oh, I had a newer version that I was been reading out of. So uh, I don't know about you, but I'd rather go old school today and say, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Unlike Luke and Matthew, John actually doesn't record the example that Jesus gives how he should pray, but he actually records Jesus praying. Chapter 17, verse 1 reads, When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may be glorified, that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him, and this is eternal life, that they know you the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. It's the final scene. It's after the farewell meal. Jesus stops speaking to his disciples, and he prays. He says he lifts up his voice, and he lifts up to Jesus his eyes, and he addresses God in prayer. Not necessarily a pattern, but he is modeling for us how we ought to pray. The prayer highlights, in a sense, the unity of the Father and the Son. And the unity of the Father and the Son and the believing community. Because he incorporates those who he have given me. Jesus prays in full awareness of the arrival of the hour, of the transition, of the change of the moment, of the end of the earthly ministry, of the close of the season, and of the expectation of the new. Verse 3 says, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. This is eternal life. He gives us a definition of the gift of eternal life. This is eternal life. It's more than an endless existence. This is eternal eternal life. It's to know God, which is made possible because of Jesus. Eternal life begins now, begins today. Eternal life is not just a gift of immortality or a future life in heaven, but it's a life shaped by knowledge of God revealed in Jesus. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. 
So if, the, if it's the call of the disciples, if it is the call of Christians, then we have a model of living like Christ in 2020. So I want to follow that model as Jesus prays, and I want to invite you to join me in the journey as we journey with Jesus through this prayer. He prays for his disciples locally, but he's also praying for his disciples globally, you and me. And the first thing I gather from this is, as living like Christ in 2020 is, we need to stay in the work. Look at verse 4. It says, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Stay. Our charge is to stay in the work. Everyone has a work. Everyone has been given an opportunity, a, a will, a plan, a purpose. The work you gave me to do. For Jesus, it was a specific work. And for you and for me, we have a specific work. Jesus did not compare his work to other people. Jesus did not compare his work to other disciples or to other prophets. Jesus, Jesus completed his work. Oh, Lord, I need to be content is what our, our, our week of prayer said. I need to be content to leave the results to you and to do your work. God has a work for our life. God has a plan for your life. God has a plan for my life. We, we, we have an intelligent design. We were created to bear the image of God. None of us was a mistake or without intention. God brought you forth for a purpose, for a work. And living like Christ is to stay in the work. Everyone has a work. Yesterday in our leadership conference, he brought out that it's not just the gifted ones. Because sometimes we think, oh, he has a calling or she has a she's gift. No, we all have a work that God has given us to do. Everyone has a work and everyone can complete the work. Verse 4 says, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. Now, I know some of us as parents, uh, we have... We have plans for our children. And some of us children, we know our parents had a plan for us. But here we see that God gave Jesus a work to do. The work of God gave can be completed. Verse 6 says, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. So what people has God given to you? What, what, what's your circle of influence that God has placed in you? Those are the ones God has given you out of the world. Yours they are, and you, he gave them to you, and they are accomplished and complete your work when they keep your word. We want to hear those words in Matthew chapter 25, verse 23. When his master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant, you have been faithful over a little, I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Now there's a lot of things I hope to hear at the end of my life, but the most important thing I want to hear is the words that come through Jesus Christ, through God who says, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master. This past week, uh, there was a memorial service for Dr. Lois Evans, who passed away the wife of, of Dr. Tony Evans. And my wife uh, gave me the link, and I just was intrigued just by watching the YouTube replay or version of that, the recording of that, and how she was, the, the, the children, the adult children, all probably in their own particular form of ministry, were ascribing to their mama that she had completed the work that God gave her and now had passed it on to them for them to complete their work. What an amazing thing. 
It was a sad event because they had lost their mom only at the age of 70. And, and some of us have been influenced by her ministry and will continue to be influenced by her ministry. Some were questioning why she would, she would die of a particular form or rare form of cancer. And maybe God did not answer the prayers of everyone. But if you go and, and you hear that, you will hear the response. That Jesus said, what they, they, they felt that God said, what, uh, God is taking care of them. And when she wakes up, she's either going to be with family or she's going to be with family. And when she wakes up, she's either going to be with God or she's going to be with God. So it's yes and yes. One of my favorite Andre Crouch songs is called Well Done. Well done, good and faithful servant. When I see your precious face. All I want to hear him say is, well done. There's a verse in there that, that uh, James Felix comes in and sings. He says, I want to be pleasing in his sight every day of my life. Don't want to do anything to bring a reproach on the master's name. I want to let my good light shine so the world can see that this joy I have is only because he's living in me. Living like Christ is to stay in the work. Observe the work that God has given you right now. Observe the people that are around you. Those are the ones God has given you right now. Stay in the work. The next thing I see here is we ought to stay in the name. Chapter 17, verse 11 says, And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you, Holy Father, Keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. Jesus trusts his community into the care of God. It's kind of my prayer this past weekend. Lord, keep them in your name. Go to LAX, Lord, keep her in your name. I walk down the street over here, Lord, keep them in your name your name. Christ does not pray that they might be rich and great in the world, but that they may be kept from sin, strengthened for their duty, and brought to safe heaven. Living like Christ is to stay in the name. Chapter 12, chapter 17, verse 12 says, while I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction that the scriptures might be fulfilled. The pronoun is emphatic. While I was in the world, I kept them. I am now praying that you will keep them. While I have the opportunity, I kept them. I now pray that you keep them. Jesus says, I have kept, acting as the representative on earth. You are the representative on earth to keep those that God has given you. Kept us is the idea of preservation. James Cleveland used to sing a song that says, oh, to be kept by Jesus, kept by the power of God, kept from the world unspotted, treading where Jesus trod. Oh, to be kept by Jesus, Lord, at thy feet I fall. I would be nothing, nothing, nothing. Thou shalt be all in all. Now that's old school. Oh, to be kept by Jesus. The name preserves us, kept. Guarded reminds us that Jesus wants us to be protected. I have kept and I have guarded. The name of Jesus helps us to fulfill the mission that God has given us. Verse 13 reads, But now I am coming to you. And these things I speak in the world, that they may, be, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Oh, I think we're all looking for some kind of fulfillment. I'm, look, I'm looking to, to, that, that the things I do matter and that I find fulfillment in the things that I do do. It's kind of tough to, that, that I can't necessarily guarantee the results, but to do what the work the Lord has given me. I, I want to hear, hear my adult children say, Dad, you were a good dad 
well done. I, 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 want, I want to hear the church members say, you're a good pastor, well done. I want to hear my students on their course evaluation say, you are a good professor, well done. That don't always happen. However, we do have to keep them, and we do have to give them the name of Jesus. The thought is that Jesus is praying out loud so that his disciples could hear that they would have joy even in sorrow, that they would have joy even in loneliness, that they might be fulfilled with the same joy, Jesus' joy, great joy Jesus has by saving people. It's the joy of the resurrection. It's the joy of the ascension. It's the joy of the second coming we have because it includes our destination of heaven. The name protects and the name brings joy. Living like Christ is to stay in the work. It's to stay in the name. And today I bring you to staying in the world. Verse 14 says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Stay in the world. Stay connected to the world. The world, those who do not know God. That was one of the phrases John uses throughout the gospel. Chapter 1, chapter 7, chapter 12, chapter 15, chapter 16. Uh, in fact, chapter 16, verse 33 says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. The world will hate and not like some things because we're an extension of Jesus. However, Jesus had a mission with the world. He did not give up on the world. God does not give up on the world. For God so loved the world that he gave Jesus. And for God still loves the world that he gives you to the world. Well, come on now. We ought to have a worldly mission. Look at verse 16 says, they are not of the world just as, as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. In this prayer, Jesus said that we who believe in him are not of unbelieving sinful world. We're not of this world. Just as he was not of the unbelieving sinful world. Not of this world, but in this world. God loves the world. He sends Jesus. God loves the world. He sends you on a mission. God loves your family. That's why you're there. God loves this community. That's why you're here. God loves your school. That's why you are there. God loves your friends. That's why you are there. We ought to have a worldly mission. Jesus prayed, sanctify them by truth. Your word is truth. This somewhat has a dual meaning, sanctification. See, we are sanctified, first of all, by his declaration that we belong to him in Jesus Christ. And second of all, we are sanctified by the ongoing influence of scripture on our lives. We need to be sanctified because as God sent Jesus into the world to do the will of the Father, so also... Christ has sent us into the world to do the will of Jesus. Sanctification. You ought to go to your Bible study or Sunday school. If Brother Larry was here, he would yeah, go to Sunday school. I'd do a little breakdown of sanctification in there. Sanctification, it's, it's an instantaneous work, which both sets one apart and crucifies and cleanses the old nature, enabling the believer to be free from the dominant rule of sin. We have a worldly mission. There is work for the world. Living like Christ is to have a worldly mission, and it's the strength to do it. Verse 20 says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us, 
that the world may believe that you have sent me. This is, expresses perhaps one of Christ's deepest desires for his people as a whole. He mentions this four times in this prayer because unity is a primary factor in accomplishing God's mission and confirming the truth of Jesus. Only Jesus can bring people together. I, I had to relearn that lesson that even though I'm the dad, I can't seem to bring everybody into agreement in my own household. Only Jesus can bring people together. Unity, unification testifies of a God who saves and forgives and delivers us. Only Jesus brings that forth. It confirms the truth of Jesus. We read of the purpose of prayer, which is unity. The union of the church would be the same as the union of God the Father and God the Son. That we would be on the same page. It's not to agree on everything, but that we're on the same page, that we're all worldly sinners saved by grace through Jesus Christ. He does not pray that to become one, but rather that they may be one. It's an ongoing action to continually be one. It's spiritual unity of the heart, one writer writes, mind and purpose. The witness is so that the world may believe. Jesus prays for all those who will come to believe through the witness of you, of me, through the witness of the community of faith. Your testimony matters. Your witness matters. It affirms who Jesus Christ is. It brings unity to the congregation, and it brings people to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. We care about the world. The world matters. Your testimony, the way you live life matters. Living like Christ is to stay in the work, stay in the name, and stay in the world. I mean, my dad tells a story, if you don't believe, read the book or listen to the podcast of when he was saved that he wanted the Lord to take him out. He, was, he reached to take me out, and somebody heard him praying, Lord, take me to heaven right now. He said, no, the Lord needs you right here. You have a work to do. My mama tells me the story, or my dad told me the story that he was praying later on when we were all, all six of us were around, and my dad was going off to wherever, somewhere, and he, my mom heard him praying, Lord, I've done all the work. Take me out. I'm ready to go. My mom said, oh, no, you don't. You have some kids to raise. The Lord has given you a work. Stay in the world. Did I say it right there? Did I paraphrase it right? Yes, check check the, bot, the podcast. I'll confirm that. Jesus prays for his disciples. But I think for us today, it's important to know that Jesus prays for you. Yes. Stay in the work. Stay in the name. Stay in the world. Leads us to verse 24. And you know, I love, I love happy endings. It says, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you may that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world one day we will be with Jesus one day we will see the glory of Jesus one day we will hear Jesus say well done enter into the joy of the Lord one day we will have that that glorious moment of, of experiencing the fulfillment of eternal life, the conclusion of eternal life, to be with Jesus, to see his glory face to face. That's our destiny. You have a destiny. One day we will be there, and we are on the road to that destiny. And in the meanwhile, on the road, stay in the work, stay in the name, and stay in the world.